Okay, so it's time to get back to the project. So let's make sure we're set up in such a way that this can capture what's going on. Get things back in place here. So I have the initial rough proposal for myself here, and um, I'm now going to start working with some finishing aspects of the piece. Uh, and the challenge now is to create um, the dynamics and the rhythmic structure, the musicality that really reflects uh, the qualities that we've identified here so that we can animate the space around the mask in such a way that it uh, plays and communicates the qualities that we desire. And this is always one of the most challenging parts of creating the living sculpture um, or the rhythmic form, however one wants to describe it, because Ultimately, what it looks like here and what it's going to actually play as when we get it here don't always coincide. I sometimes think I'm creating something that then it winds up being something very different uh, in spite of what I see here. And of course, over the years, as uh, I've gotten better at uh, what I'm doing in terms of actually realizing uh, what is intended, um, I have a better idea now of how to create success. Uh, and yet, one has to let the material play uh, on its own as well and sort of follow after what's developing as well as creating the position that's here. So. We've got two qualities that we're trying to reflect. We've got the quiet warrior and the black knight. Um, and in all cases, everything that we impose here or are successful at creating will also have its opposite reflected in the form. So uh, we're looking for in the quiet warrior uh, a calm, loving, joyful, uh, dynamic, right? That has um, uh, a sense of laughter to it, right? Uh, uh, a percussive nature, right? And of course, when we impose that, we're gonna get the opposite of it as well. Um, because that's just the nature of how form works. Everything that moves like this also moves like this. Everything that moves down, moves up, and so forth. So we wind up with the opposites there. But this is also true of our human nature. And for the Black Knight, we've got pride, arrogance, anger, fear, right? So um, uh, we're, we're going to need some of that dynamic. I'm also working with the qualities, some animal qualities, in terms of the, the, the power of a lion um, and uh, some of that sort of eager stalwart aspect of a dog um, and have uh, some of those images over here on the track sheet as well so that I constantly be reminding myself of some of the forms that I'm working towards. So that's how the decisions are being made here. Um, in any case, uh, and I'm not sure that I can really, like, clearly articulate why everything is being done. Um, one of the great challenges to uh, to this um, work is uh, trying to create some semblance of uh, symmetry in the forms that are being created. Um, so 
I, I usually work on one side of the mask and then uh, um, try to repeat what I've done uh, on the other side uh, to varying degree. We want, uh, you know, it's interesting because we want to avoid um, complete symmetry. Uh, and of course, if I'm sculpting, complete symmetry is not possible because it's out of my skill sets. Um, but also, you know, the human body is not symmetrical. Um, even for those people who have uh, a very symmetrical structure, it's still not perfectly symmetrical. Um, and in the form of all this stuff uh, that we're doing, it's the asymmetry that in the end is going to allow everything to play. Um, so I'm now working on getting the opposite eyelid in. Um, I always find it quite interesting how uh, every tiny addition to the mask, the form, um, completely changes the, uh, the overall quality of the mask. And of course, as I've gotten better over the years, um, I can see, I can see those shifts in the most subtle of, uh, of shifts and changes. I might be the only one that can see that at this point. But nonetheless, I, I can. Um, I'm going to adjust the camera here so that we get a different angle of the work. Don't know if that'll actually uh, be of any interest to us, but we'll give it a we'll give it a whirl. See if we can um, get in there. Maybe see what's happening there. A lot of times when I'm working, I'll just try to articulate things that I see and why I work on certain parts at certain times. Um, as I was putting some material in there, I noticed that the bridge of the nose here could use a little bit more material in some areas. It's um, sometimes difficult to accommodate uh, the camera aspects of what's happening, simply because um, I'm very used to working either in complete silence, because it's very zen, um, or uh, I've got music playing, which sometimes it's helping me with the work I'm doing in the forum. Other times it's just me entertaining myself or listening to audiobooks often um, here in the studio. Learning about, recently learning about how um, our current environmental scientists and forestry experts have um, been articulating what our indigenous peoples all over the world have known for centuries, actually thousands of years, for the millennia, I guess is how you say that, um, and that there's not multiple organisms on the planet that compete with one another for survival, but in fact, it's all one big organism uh, where everything's interconnected. And if you do something to one thing, one living entity, you do it to all of them. And this is shown through all the interconnected nature of the mycorrhizal networks in the soil matrix, as well as fungal 
bacterial networks and the way that travels through air and water. Um, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, and certainly no, no surprise. One of the things that I've been trying to work on here um, with this form is um, some of these lines I need uh, in the form in order to create the rhythmic aspects of the passions we're after. And uh, subtle adjustment is needed, especially in this area, because what we want to do is to avoid um, or looking at at sort of these types of lines in the structure, they can um, they can in some ways create something that looks uh, angry or uh, evil, and um, neither one of those are qualities that we are looking for. So I have to soften the angles or change the angles in order to get the expressive nature of what it is that we're looking for sculpted into the piece. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, uh, the fact that um, Tom sent me a whole bunch of images of him making facial expressions that his daughter took of him um, I didn't print any of those out, uh, but they're pretty, they're pretty in my head, as well as uh, some of the imagery of Tom that uh, I've watched in the videos and so forth. And um, he's definitely in this shape and form uh, already. Um, based on sort of what the, the shape of the head is becoming here. Um, there's hair here, so f for either one of us, we just have to pretend like that's something we still have. Um, and for me, that's gonna, that's gonna work into the rhythmic, act, the rhythmic aspects of what we're working for, it's gonna draw us up and also it's gonna um, help us with uh, the uh, animistic um, aspects of what we are attempting to achieve here. And in this case, I'm gonna get the same sort of angular drop. Sometimes by going back and forth, I can identify something that is more accurate just out of its feel rather than what it looks like. Looks can be deceiving when we're dealing with a uh, three-dimensional form because what something looks like when looking down on it like this is going to change when I shift shift the piece and look at it from a different angle. I'm going to see where it's actually not as accurate as I had anticipated. However, I will say that sometimes that asymmetry, the mistake or the inaccuracy is really, in the end, what we are after. Which is why, as I said earlier, you know, the clients that want these incredibly exacting, mechanically produced uh, looking pieces that have been run off a 3D printer, um, they might look cool for cosplay for about five seconds, uh, but they're not going to play. They're not living form. And, um, you know, the, <laughs> in order to be alive, to create living form, one has to kind of be a mess. Um, so, uh, that's actually a thing. Um, 
a, uh, it can be a planned mess or a controlled mess, but a mess nonetheless. Let me get some rough out here. I don't know that in this particular instance with this project, when I'm done with the rough out, if I will completely clean it before uh, sending the image proposals to Tom. Although also what's going to be different about this project is I'm going to, as we go through this, because I'm making a lot of decisions and creating a lot of things uh, um, and sharing the, the video with Tom, um, he's going to see part of the process and some of the aspects of the, of the piece before any other client would see. Um, because I, I find... Um, that sharing process pictures with um, with the clients is not often useful to the clients. They don't really know what to see. People tend to, who aren't really creatives um, or who don't think in systems and imagery um, have a, can sometimes have a really difficult time uh, seeing what something can be in its unfinished form or imagining something that they're not looking at. And so they attempt to micromanage what it is that they're seeing because, you know, when we imagine stuff in our head, we take it to a different place than, um, we, we take it to our own place uh, rather than to a place where someone else might be seeing it to going. And so, you know, in the, in the theater world, it's why we build you know, models of sets and so forth, so that um, an entire team of people can see and actually talk about specifics of a design um, rather than everybody just talking about some sort of imaginary thing that everybody's imagining from really just their own perspective, their own deal. Um, and of course, the reason why certain creative teams form and then stay as creative teams is because they they begin to understand each other intuit what's going on and don't necessarily need all the material evidence because they begin to see things as uh, a collective without having to discuss it first um, in great detail and so they're not disagreeing outwardly when they're actually in agreement, which is always a fun conversation to have with collaborators. I'm still working on trying to create some semblance of symmetry here. Um, in the repetition of what's happening from one side to the next. These days, in my advanced maturity, I find that it doesn't seem to matter how much light I put on something, I still can't see it. Um, Thing, you know that just passed through my mind as I looked at this and we might have to talk about this because what I'm seeing now in terms of the lines and the shapes and the form um, are starting to be very uh, sort of culturally suggestive to indigenous forms and I'll have to take a look at some of my books to see like what I might inadvertently be appropriating here through this the interesting thing about the mask work is that it's incredibly universal and um, 
uh, I often find things as I'm working that um, are not specific to me, but often already exist because what I'm engaged in here is nothing new. It's been going on since actually, I think before humans could speak. Um, mask making is one of the most, it's one of the oldest art forms, I think, you know, someone should prove me wrong. Um, one of them, uh, you know, which originally just required enough skill to cut the head off of an animal, hollow it out quickly before it got too cold, toss it on your head and dance around a fire in celebration of the hunt and the food that was going to sustain and bring life. Um, we have cave paintings that depict such things, uh, which are quite fascinating. At least that's our interpretation of them. Um, but it might not be too inaccurate. This always happens. I get to a place in the mask where it's like, okay, this hasn't, this doesn't look anything like the other thing, and yet everything above it appears to actually somehow be depicted in a more symmetrical way. And then, of course, as I start adjusting, I discover how wrong I am. I always go through a moment of struggling on all pieces where I begin wishing that I were a much better sculptor than I am. And that I actually had skills. Because it's never lost on me. The fact that I trained as an actor and a dancer and have no training in the visual arts for this sort of stuff. And so have no sort of training sash teachery sort of pedagogical intuitive way of looking at this type of stuff that allows me to fall back on my training to reference technique to see if I actually do know what I'm doing. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's how I understand, uh, it's how I work as a, as a performer and as a teacher. I still have the voices of my teachers and my attempt to understand what it was that they were saying to me going through my mind. I'm constantly learning from that feedback. Um, and that, that's a commentary of the teaching at the Lecoq School in Paris Conservatory. Um, which was taught through a, a pedagogical method called via negativa, where you're defining everything by saying what it is not. It's a pretty difficult way to learn. Um, 
but incredibly powerful if you can get your way through it. It's not something that we'd be able to do in its purity in any capacity right now in this country because <clears throat> uh, the youth would probably burn their teachers at the stake because it doesn't, it's not an affirming way of teaching. Um, it's a provocative and a challenging way of teaching. Um, if not done responsibly, it can seem cool. Or it can not only seem cool, but it can be cool. Um, but when done responsibly and well, it is really an incredibly powerful tool because it's, it teaches you how to teach yourself um, for the rest of your life because it get, provides a foundation of understanding that is yours and yours alone, not your, not your teachers. Your teacher can't, know, can't, can't take any credit for, uh, for your, the knowledge that you've gained. Only you can do that through your experience based on the foundation that they, they uh, built, helped you build for yourself, right? allows one of its one of the powers that it has is it allows you to build something that you totally can own um, that's why I think that a lot of the students when interviewed from the school um, at least when I was doing my research uh, for my my thesis uh, all those years ago really often you know didn't give the cock a lot of credit for their learning it was the gift that he gave them really um, this sense that they could take complete ownership for what it was that they took away from the teaching it's a pretty selfless, incredible way of teaching, I think. Um, <laughs> oh dear. We might have to pull back on these lips after I'm done uh, because of they're taking on some qualities that we may or may not want to entertain. It's interesting how facial structure, skeletal structure, and all that kind of stuff is so informative. Um, and so specific, really. Uh, And yet what's underneath it is just another human being with its universal experience of, you know, whatever it is the human condition is. We take away the past and have only the present moment and what's in that moment and nothing else. All we're left with is a sense of calm, discovery of what it is around us, and then a navigating it through the next discovery. Um, and that's a pretty big thing. That noise was me kicking the lamp which I do at least eight times a day. You would think by now, after all these years, that I would stop kicking that lamp, but apparently we just, it's part of our relationship. I'm using the calipers now to sort of identify um, the asymmetry, trying to create, because I'm confused as to why I can't get the, uh, the shape to cooperate right now. 
between the two sides. What is it that's off that's not allowing me to, to actually get what it is that I'm after? And in certain areas of the mask, it sometimes takes a lot more time than others. Um, over the years, I've tried to change the way I work so that I'm like go back and forth instead of sculpt one entire entire side of the mask and then and then reach to do the other side. Um, and I always start out wanting to do that with the best of intentions, and then just wind up doing what I always do. We always think we can change. I read a, a note that my kindergarten teacher sent home to my mother about my behavior and sort of how I interacted with the other children. And it was a little horrifying because I was like, oh, well, there haven't been any changes there. <laughs> it's funny. It was really well articulated too. She must have been a really great teacher. This incredibly architectural way of sculpting with the really hard lines and like the clear forms. Um, I've discovered uh, that um, it's a good way to begin uh, with what is going on with the mask. Uh, and then I can actually see better what's going on with the forms that are in the, from a rhythmic point of view. And then later on down the line, if in terms of what we're after, in terms of the dynamics of the piece, we want to soften those lines, it's easy to do. But in many ways, I prefer this really architectural look. It's about clear choices. Um, you know, as far as, you know, as far as musical notes are concerned, every single note has a very clear beginning and a very clear ending. And um, the duration of the note is dictated by how long it hangs out in the middle. Um, and when you combine the notes, um, that middle part of the note with its very clear beginnings and endings creates harmonies, creates tonal qualities, um, and... Uh, and all that with, uh, with rhythmic life based on the tempo that it's being played at. Um, and it creates a very specific piece of music in a very clear style. And, uh, and so I think this is why I like um, the really architectural look of the mask because it, it really, it's, it, the musicality of it is much clearer it's more specific. It's easier to read and see. And of course, then if it's for, intended for performance, um, it's being experienced in, in movement and moments of stillness. And um, uh, that's, that then becomes easier to, for an audience to experience. I just cut off everything that I was just working on and ended my ability to <laughs> get the symmetry that I was looking for. I was, you know, 
I, I suppose I could say that it's hilariously frustrating when I am working on something in an area of the mask for so long and I'm not finding my way to success. Everything about mask making is like a metaphor for life. Um, everything takes time. And what looks like obvious solutions somehow never is. And then you search forever and find the actual obvious solution that you weren't seeing because it was staring you right in the face. Or you see the obvious solution because you learned a whole bunch of things along the way. Suddenly you made the solution obvious. There was nothing there to inform you before. This is why sculpting is a very zen activity. If one is doing it consciously, or with consciousness, there are a lot of things about it that can speak to greater solutions. And come to understandings that you sometimes didn't know you were looking for. I like to think of the masks as looking at the world through the eyes of another or through the perspective of someone other. Because when you look through the eyes of the mask, you have to look into the world with the perspective of the mask, not just your perspective. You have to give up what you know to see through the perspective of another. And you have to search for where that relates to you, where there are similarities, and then come to an understanding of where there are differences. So you have to give up some of the things that you know, and you have to adopt certain things that you hadn't considered before. <clears throat> In order to see through the eyes of the mask that you've picked up. And the challenge in the sculpting is to, oops, create that perspective. Good thing I never dropped tools on the floor. <clears throat> I've created a whole workshop where I literally don't have to bend over very often to pick up anything because of some back injuries I incurred years and years ago. And then I spend all day just dropping stuff on the floor, so then I wind up bending over anyway. It's a clown routine. And sometimes, you know, well, I, I would say sometimes, often, or always, um, the challenge with uh, the seeking of symmetry and the sculpture ends when you've decided that you either can justify the asymmetry and the rhythmic aspects of the mask. In other words, you've convinced yourself that whatever problems you can solve are not important. Um, or there's something that emerges in how the mask is developing that allows for that asymmetry to actually speak something of importance in relationship to what it is that you thought you were looking for, you found it in a different way, or you didn't know that's what you were looking for, but that's actually what you were looking for. 
And of course, those can all be decisions made on, you know, when you make them, you can allow that to be the case, um, rather than trying to impose a preconceived notion on something. Once again, it's a little bit like life. We all have these preconceived notions of who we are and what we should be doing and what is success and happiness and joy and all these sorts of things. And what we find along the way is that a lot of what we thought was the way things should be or are or not at all that in any way, shape, or form. And then we have to decide whether we like what we're discovering better or not. I've been listening to a lot of Eckhart Tolle's books in 2020, it started with The Power of Now, which got me through the global shutdown and the loss of my home and creative studios. Um, and this idea of just simply living in the present moment and allowing the information in that moment to be the only existing factor in one's emotional well-being. And for me, it would seem to work pretty well. But sustaining that is uh, over the long haul not easy. And it's one has to constantly be reminding oneself that past really isn't important, it doesn't exist. I have to bring it with us and that the future hasn't happened yet so it's not real we need not worry about it Sometimes watch these videos on either Instagram or YouTube of sculptors speed sculpting portraiture and statuary and how extraordinarily fast the sculptors are at achieving just ridiculously active, accurate work. And I think, I think, well, that would be nice. All right, so now I'm seeing some differences between some form here. So we're gonna, we've got one Got one of these uh, brows that's coming out more and another that's dropping down. So I have to decide which one is more helpful in terms of our concept sheet. And I'm choosing the one that drops down because um, it removes kind of the angry aspect. And the the um, the expressive the expressive quality of the mask is uh, instead of as it looks down, it's rhythmic quality is this 
as opposed to this, right? Um, and then as it comes back, it comes up like this, which is a more prideful rhythmic response. Um, but it also allows for our sense of love if we need it. Um, it also helps us with uh, the qualities and the movements of fear as well, so that we know that those are hopefully present when we're done. I want to say one thing I'm stoked about what I'm seeing here is that I've never actually sculpted a mask that looks like this one before. Um, and I'm often like, I'm kind of stoked about that when I make something because I've, I've done so many of these, you know, over the years at this point, you know, I don't know, there have probably been well over 500, uh, if not more. Uh, individual designs and um, it's not infrequently where I'm sculpting away at something and I look down and I'm like well I've made this before um, and although that may fit what I'm doing at the moment uh, as an artist it's it's always nice to explore new things and know that you're growing of course one a part of the challenges of not making the same mask over and over again is even though we're after the black knight and the quiet warrior over here and this mask will still be me it's unavoidable <laughs> I am in it. No matter what. Just the nature of the way the mask making works. And we really discovered that it's at the conservatory when we all made masks and we all came back and the masks totally reflected who we were at that time. Mine was an unmitigated failure, by the way, the first mask that I made. Um, it didn't play. It was a dead form. It was uh, an expression, frozen expression in time. Great idea. Incredibly well executed. And, you know, pretty useless. Um... It was uh, a devastating failure based on what was going on at the school at the time. And I would say that it is uh, one of, the, it was the most formative failure that I experienced, that I've experienced in my life because um, every time I step in front of a sculpture stand, I'm trying to solve the problem of that mask. Um, and, uh, um, that moment really drives a quest, a research, right? a seeking, if you will, um, a continued discovery and understanding of uh, myself, my perspectives, my strengths and my weaknesses. And through understanding those, I'm, I think that helps me to understand others better. And given my work outside the sculpture studio as a community builder, um, That's very helpful.
this is really the tedious part um, in some sense. Uh, because the adjustments are subtle constantly. And whenever I adjust or make a change in one place, um, I have to make it in another. And then I've changed everything. <laughs> right now, I've got this shape at the top of the nose that I cannot get adjusted so that it speaks the same thing on either side. It's like both sides of this mask are having to do with each other. Mm. Which, of course, is not true. I just have to figure out what it is that what the solution is to what I'm seeing here. I'm hoping that this is it. So from the subtle angle on something, because it's a three-dimensional form. And, and this is one of the difficulty, one of the difficult things to teach a young mask, the young mask makers, uh, those folks who are interested, is how to see the three-dimensional form when you're working on it. So that if you're constantly looking down on it like this, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't become flat, like a plate. Something. And of course, when I have figured out how to get something more symmetrical, then I really have to look at it and decide, was that what I was looking for? Does that just create another problem? And in this case, it might have. I have to turn off the heater now because it is truly getting like hell in here. Now we wait for it to get really cold. <laughs> My last studio is on the third floor of the of the home, and um, it was never super chilly because. He rises and it was an old Victorian mansion, so you couldn't have kept, you know, all of the heat from the whole building lighting up in the studio. All right. Well, I'm going to turn off the video now and start uh, working on this in um, incredible detail, uh, which is a little difficult to see with this. 
uh, but I can show us what it's looking like now. Um, uh, so here we have the shape, the form. It's hard to tell. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll be smarter about this. Can I flip this around? I can't. All right. So this is, uh, this is what we're looking at right now. Um, and I'm going to head to it in super detail. Uh, it's hard for me to do that with the video running because I always feel like I have to like be interesting. And from a rhythmic point of view, this is going to be pretty, pretty quiet, pretty fastidious. Um, it's one of those things that right now, like on Instagram, if we were editing it together, we'd have to do a speed video on it. Um, and, uh, um, or a time lapse, I guess is what they call it. So, um, yeah. So we'll pick this up with the video uh, later.